Hey, this is Eric, and this is a recording of a session I did for the 2021 Spark Educational Technology Conference. This session is titled Hipster Google, and it's all about the lesser known Google tools and how you and your students can use them for teaching, learning, and creating. I hope you enjoy the recording. Well, hey, folks, welcome everybody to the uh, 2021 Spark Educational Technology Conference. We are so excited to have you with us here for uh, this session on Hipster Google, tools you probably never heard of, uh, presented by me. Uh, for the benefit of everybody, as a, as a friendly reminder, please, during the session, uh, do keep your microphone muted. Um, and I'd suggest turning the webcam off as well, if that helps with the uh, bandwidth. Um, um, and then to participate in the session, I would encourage you to please use the chat feature um, in Google Meet to ask any questions or uh, share any comments or uh, resources throughout the session. I've got the uh, chat open on another screen here, and so I'll do my best to, to keep an eye on that. I see some people already uh, saying good morning in there and saying where they're from, and please feel free to do that as well. Uh, the session is being recorded. As we mentioned, it is available for viewing afterwards on the conference website. Um, at this moment, though, it is my pleasure to kick off our uh, session here on Hipster Google. So, howdy, everybody. My name is Eric. Uh, quick little introduction, quick little housekeeping here. Um, I am a, uh, a tech integration specialist at uh, here at Spark, and uh, there's my little uh, hipstery picture there <laughs> for our session. Uh, this is my 30th year in education. I uh, started off as a middle school math teacher, taught middle school math for seven years at North Canton Middle School, and then moved into a role as a tech coach or a tech integrationist there for North Canton Schools. Uh, and I've been doing that ever since. I currently work at the Stark County Educational Service Center um, at Spark um, as a tech integration specialist serving about 35 school districts here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, that's my day job. Um, and then on the side, I'm a Google certified trainer and innovator and uh, get a chance to work with folks all around the country, which is exciting uh, to get to do that. Uh, today, though, our focus for this particular session uh, is hipster Google tools you probably never heard of. Uh, so a little bit of uh, explanation before we dive into that as to what what are we talking about? What, what is a hipster Google? Uh, so the idea is years ago, several years ago, when the phrase hipster, when the term hipster was first sort of becoming something that was a little bit more well known, um, I thought this would be really fun to apply this to Google because the hipster idea is if you're a hipster, you know, you're somebody who knows about things that other people don't, something that's really like a, a really awesome band that well, nobody's heard of this band. And that's what makes them really cool because I know about them and nobody else knows about them, kind of an underground sort of a feel uh, or, you know, a, a hobby or some sort of a book or an interest, anything that's like lesser known. And that brings sort of an element of coolness to it. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's awesome. That's, that's really cool. And what if though, what if we applied that same idea to Google? Because we all know the big Google tools. We all know Google Docs and we know Google Drive and we know Gmail. You know, we know the big Google tools, but it turns out that there are a lot of lesser known hidden gems. There's a lot of lesser known tools and projects that Google has done over the years um, that slip through the cracks. One of the big things that Google tries to do is encourage innovation in their company. So they do something called 20% time. You may have heard that before, but 20% time is where uh, the employees are allowed to use basically one day out of every five to work on a project of their choosing, as long as it's something that, you know, moves forward, some cool tech innovation, and a lot of really neat things have come out of that, plus Google has their uh, experiments with Google section, and they just have so many things that they're creating, and I thought, how about if I started collecting these together? And that was the birth of Hipster Google. So several years ago, I started collecting together, hey, these are lesser known tools, and maybe I had, you know, 20 of them or so, and well, that has grown over the years. And so um, to get to the full list, you can uh, 
uh, pull that up while we go through the session today if you would like. It can be found at bit.ly slash Kurtz hipster. That'll let you get to that running list of uh, resources that I pulled together. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just make it a little bit easier for you guys. And I'm going to copy the link and drop it right into the chat. So if that makes it easier for you to access. Now, again, you do not have to open the document now. You can just watch as I present this. Totally fine. But for those that want to, you know, poke a stick at it and try some of these out now, please feel free to jump in that document. If nothing else, take note of the address so that you can uh, explore these later on your own. And uh, this is a, an ongoing list. I add new things to it all the time because Google's always putting out, you know, newer, new, new tools. Uh, I try to keep them kind of organized. So you'll see there's search tools, then map tools, creative tools communication tools and miscellaneous tools. Um, and some of them could probably cross over the boundaries, but you know, I tr tried to bring a little bit of order to this to this uh, madness here. So, um, so absolutely feel free to uh, take a look at that while we're heading through the session. Feel free to make a copy of the document if that's easier for you, bookmark it, whatever you might want to do is fine. All right, so there you go. That is that is the plan uh, for our session here today. I will warn you, this is kind of one of those put your seatbelt on and hold on tight sessions because as you can see, we got about 60 or so googly tools in this hipster session. And uh, uh, we won't be able to go into all of them in great depth, but I hope to touch on each of them. And then every other one here or there, we'll dig in a little bit deeper and stuff. Now, having said that, if I, if I skip over one or just go a little quickly and there's one that you're curious about, let me know. Throw a question in the chat. If I go too quickly on something, you say, hey, can we circle back around to this one? Or if you have a question on it, or if you've used some of these in your class, I would love to hear how you've used them. So please throw stuff in the chat. If you, yeah, I've used that tool, and here's how our students used it, and this was what was awesome about it. Um, and of course, if you have hipstery tools I forgot to put on the list, share those as well. All right, well, I think that hopefully gave everybody plenty of time to get settled in. I don't see any more uh, pop-ups coming up asking people to be admitted. So I think we've, I think we've settled in uh, to, our, to our, our roster here for this morning. So we'll go ahead and get going. So again, thanks guys so much for being here in the session. All right, let's hit the ground running here with our first category of tools. And again, I'm just gonna move through these pretty quick. <laughs> you stop me if you think uh, there's something we need to talk a little bit more about or need some more details on. So let's begin with our first category of search tools. Um, so basically what I've got here is just a whole bunch of googly tools that are lesser known that deal something with searching. So let's dive in and start taking a look at these. So the very first one, and these, by the way, they're going to go exactly in the order of the, of the agenda documents. If you're following along in the Google Doc, exact same order that I'm going through here in the slideshow. So the first one is an oldie but a goodie. This one has been around for a long time. This is this this is not a new tool. Um, it's called Ingram Viewer, but still I find a lot of times people have not heard of this one. So Ingram Viewer, I'll go ahead and open it up here. Pop that open, give it just a moment to open up there. Ingram Viewer is a product from Google Books. So if you're not familiar with Google Books, that's Google's initiative, where basically they're trying to scan in every book that has ever existed. And so Google Books is just, you know, just a massive, you know, database of, you know, every book from the last 500 years scanned in. Well, now that they have all of this text scanned in, they can do some really cool things with it. One of the fun hipstery things they did from it is they created Ingram Viewer. So what is this? Ingram Viewer is a website where at the top you can put in search terms and just put a comma in between them. And then what it does is Ingram Viewer searches through all of the books that Google has scanned in and it shows the relative frequency of those words. Now what's so neat about this is it can tell a story. It can show how over time different concepts have become more you know, popular or have faded out of view or certain concepts have overtaken others. Just as a quick, very simple example here, let me put one in. And so this is one I've, I've done usually, I think it's a good example, it kind of shows this well. Um, I'm gonna search for the Great War, the World War and Thank World you. War I. Um, and when I do that, what you'll notice is it creates a, um, a graph here showing the relative frequency of those three phrases. Now, 
you would probably know that the Great War and the World War and World War I, they're all the same thing. They all refer to the same war. Um, not much happened before 1900, so I will trim that up to 1900 just to make the graph a little bit easier to see. What's interesting is to see how the frequency of these have changed. So the blue line is the Great War. And so for a while, that was the most commonly used phrase of the three. Well, as we approach 1920, it looks like right around 1919, suddenly the red line takes over and now the world war. So this it went from being a great war to being the world war. And that dominated for a long time. But then once we get into the 30s, late 30s, that starts falling. And by 1943, the green line takes over and now World War I is the most common term when used between those three. Well, obviously we know why, because World War II came along. And so, yeah, we, we had that change. Uh, now, the thing is though, our students, and I totally get this, you know, anything that's earlier than their lifetime, and the same for me, I mean, if I think of things earlier than when I was alive, it just becomes sort of this nebulous blob of the past. It's just history. And to be able to see things broken down like this can really give good insights to our students. It's not just looking at the graph, it's asking why. So I would encourage you, try some terms from your subject area, put in some things and, and, and have a comparison on there, and then look for a peak, look for a dip and say, so guys, why do you think this does this? Why back at this time do we suddenly get this spike? And this can be a really neat way for our students to think critically and get a perspective on any topic that you're studying in class. So try out Ingram Viewer if you have not uh, been there in the past. And if you do put in a neat search term that, that gives you some cool results, I'd love to hear it. So please feel free to share in the chat if you came up with a, a neat uh, result based on what you put in there. Well, let's keep on going. Other search tools, uh, Google Scholar is a fantastic search tool. I'm not gonna go ahead and open this one up. I will just chat about it real quick. Uh, Google Scholar is fantastic if you're writing a paper that requires access to scholarly articles or peer reviewed papers. Instead of searching the entire internet, Google Scholar just searches for peer reviewed scholarly articles, allows you to collect them and save them all together, allows you to read abstracts. Sometimes it lets you read the entire article, um, but at least the abstract of it. Um, and it also has a great citation tool, which will let you pick MLA, APA, APA, or Chicago, and it will give you the proper citation for it. So wonderful if you're working on a master's paper or if it's uh, high school students working on a term paper, a uh, great resource to pull from. All right, next up uh, in, in the search category is something I'm calling instant search cards. Uh, that's maybe not the real word for it, but that's what I'm calling them. So uh, one of the cool things that Google does with search is when you run certain searches, instead of getting just websites as, result, as results, you actually get interactive tools, like as I'm showing here on the screen, a timer. So for example, if I were to go over to a Google search and I were to type in the word timer, I will literally get a timer and I can go in and set the hours, minutes and seconds, then I can hit start and it'll start, you know, counting down. So if I needed to say, hey guys, we're gonna, you know, be working on a particular activity in groups and you need to be working for five minutes or 10 minutes or something, very quick and easy way to throw a timer up on the screen. Now, that is not the only one. There are so many of these that as you type in a search term, instead of getting just websites, you get these interactive things. Um, so uh, if you have some suggestions, throw those in the chat. I see uh, Shruti mentioned dice and calculator. Yes, absolutely. If you type in roll a die, you'll actually get this interactive die roll uh, um, tool that uh, includes all six of the Dungeons and Dragons dice. <laughs> so I am a D&D player. Uh, my, my daughter and son-in-law and some friends and I usually do a, a once a month D&D thing. It's kind of nice to have <laughs> all of these available, but it would also be wonderful for a math class. If you're talking about probabilities, you can throw all these different die, these different dice in there and roll them, or you can get rid of the ones you don't need and just put in the ones that you do um, and then talk about probability or if you're playing a game in class as well. Uh, and then the calculator, should you also mentioned the calculator. Yes, I use this a lot. If you just type in calc or calculator, you get an interactive calculator. Um, if there's others you guys have used, feel free to throw those in the chat and share ones that you like. I've put into the agenda two blog posts where I broke out a lot of these, uh, some of my favorites in there. So there's flip a coin, roll a die, 
define uh, to get a definition of a word and its usage over time. Uh, there's the calculator, there's unit conversions, currency conversions. You can uh, pull up the area uh, tool, the volume tool. You can graph equations, just type in an equation. You can graph it right there in Google search. How about animal sounds? Yes, you can ask what does the whatever say and uh, it'll tell you what a cow says. I don't think it knows what the fox says, but it does cover most all of the other animals uh, there uh, and on and on down the line. I love the translation one as well. This is fantastic. If you type in translate, you do get um, a uh, active translation tool here where you can either type or speak in one language and it will translate it into another great way to practice fluency for students to work on their fluency to see how well uh, so I, uh, I tried to learn a little bit of German recently. Um, please don't judge me. It is not, not, I'm not good at it at all, <laughs> but we'll just, we'll just see if my, you know, one or two phrases here. So let's try to speak in German to see if we can, can translate this. Ich bin ein Mann. Yay, I worked. <laughs> I'm a man. Oh, good, good job. All right. And on and on. So many of these. And Google's adding new ones all the time to this list. Uh, like I said, I've got two uh, links in the agenda document that have uh, these that I found over time, including uh, a, a spinner, random number generator, lots and lots of cool ones. There's new ones coming out all the time. All right, let's keep on moving. Other search things. How about reverse image search? So uh, most of us know about Google Images. Of course, yeah, everybody knows Google Images. You go to Google Images, you type in something you want to find, and you get pictures of it. That's Google Images. But did you know, and you might have, but if not, did you know there is a reverse image search? And what that means is what if you want to go the other way? What if you have a picture and you don't know what it is? Now, this could be really great for students evaluating the authenticity of things they find online. Because sometimes we come across stuff and it's like, is that real? Was that Photoshop? Is that article showing that picture being truthful? Is that really what that was from or what that was about? Well, if you go to Google Images, you'll notice in the search box, there's a little camera icon. And this allows you to upload an image or link in an image, and then Google will try to find out as much as it can about that picture for you. So this can be a really great thing for our students as they're trying to evaluate the authenticity of things they find online. As an example, let me show you. I grabbed a picture here that I thought might be a good example for us. Let me put it over here on the screen. So this is a, a picture I came across that is a shark swimming uh, in what appears to be a flooded street. And so the story behind it when this was circulating was that there was like a really bad storm and it was so bad that the streets got flooded and a and sharks had swam into town from you know out in the ocean in, into the flooded streets and this is somebody's you know uh, rearview mirror on their car. Now you may say, did that really happen? Well, we can find out. What we can do is we can go to uh, the Google Images page and we can use the little search by image button there, and then we can upload an image. So I'll go ahead and let me go to my uh, pictures here, grab my highway shark and upload him. And then as soon as I do that, we're gonna get information back and oh my gosh, yeah, lots of great feedback on here of how this is a fake. There's some articles about that. And now I can you know, dive into what was clearly a hoax and I can learn more about it. So awesome tool for students to improve some of that digital literacy uh, by a reverse image search. All right, what else do we have in the searching category? We've got Google Trends. This is an awesome site. So Google Trends is a searching site about searching. <laughs> so what this is, is you can put in any search topic you want. So again, pick something from your content area. Pick something you guys have been you know, studying about in class. And what you'll get is it can show you results for I can, it can go back, I'll check, I can't remember how, how many years back it goes now, the last 20 years or so that Google's been collecting you know, search data, it goes back quite a ways and can show you the trends of our interest in that topic. How much have we been searching for that topic? And we can break it down country by country, state by state, year by year. Now they do have some that they'll have already on here. So you can take a look at some that have been um, you know, trending recently, see what's, what's trending or over the years. But we can also just come up the top and run a search. So the one that I always love to run, because I just think it, it illustrates this so well, is if I search for the phrase Roman numerals. 
And what I want to see is how, how popular is that search? How often do people search for the phrase Roman numerals? Well, rather than just doing the past 12 months, I can go all the way back to 2004. Okay, I couldn't remember how far back it goes all the way back to 2004. So this is data of every search people have made, you know, for, you know, almost the last 20 years here. And what you notice with the Roman numerals is it's a really predictable pattern. Look at this. Every single year as we approach February, there is this spike that comes up here and all of a sudden there is this renewed interest in Roman numerals. Any idea why? Uh, anybody know? Feel free to throw it in the chat uh, if, if you know why there is a spike in February for the search Roman numerals. Yes, Tina's right on it. The Super Bowl, yes. Every year the Super Bowl comes around, people are like, what are those numbers? <laughs> so, exactly. So, so that's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful site, again, to give us some perspective on any topic that it is that we're, that we're pursuing and studying in class. All right, we got to keep moving because we got a lot of other stuff to look at. So some of these I'll just describe real quick. So Google Alerts, this is a great search site uh, to alert you anytime a new article is posted online about a topic. I encourage like principals and superintendents to use this. I encourage them to put in the name of their school building or school district. And then when they set the alert, anytime there's a blog post or a news article that includes their school, they'll get an email letting them know about it. And that's a great way to stay uh, on top of what's being said online about a particular topic, in this case, perhaps your school district. Other cool things, power searching with Google. This is an online video training course that teaches you all about how to make the most out of Google searching. Be Internet Awesome is a free online curriculum aimed mostly at elementary students, but it covers all sorts of digital literacy skills, including searching, how to search well, how to find what you're looking for, how to evaluate the, the, the authenticity of what you find. It covers other things, though, too. It covers like being kind online, setting good passwords. Um, it's all about, you know, functioning well in a digital world. There's also a game the kids can play there, and there's lots of uh, Google slideshows you can use for the instruction to go along with the curriculum. Another neat uh, searching tool is Google Dictionary. Google Dictionary is a free extension for Chrome that allows you to simply double click on any word you come across online. And when you double click on it, it'll pop up a box that pronounces the word and gives you a definition of it. So this is great if a student is a struggling reader and they're reading along and they come across where like, I'm not really sure what that word is. Well, this is one more tool to help them. As long as they've got Google Dictionary installed, they just double click on a word and it's gonna pop up that pronunciation and definition to give them that support while they are reading. Next up is a tool called Art Palette. This is a really interesting search tool because you search by color. How about that? Um, I'll pull it up real quick. We won't spend much time on it, but just enough to show you because it's a little hard to explain without seeing it. But what Art Palette does is it ties into Google's arts and culture. And we will see arts and culture popping up all throughout this session because there are so many amazing things that arts and culture. Well, what this is, is you come in and you pick a color palette that you want. And you can also just hit surprise me and it will, you know, randomly choose colors for you as well. And based upon the colors that come up in the color palette, it then searches everything in Google Arts and Culture to find paintings, sculptures, drawings that match that color palette. And you can even come in and say, hey, you know, I want a bright green and I want, you know, a bright red and I want a bright blue. You can pick, you know, the colors yourself as well. And then it will find things that match that. It can be a really neat way to explore how color gets used in different mediums. Any one of these, of course, you can click on, and then you can learn all about that particular artist and painting. It'll bring up a whole page about that. So awesome one for exploring color. Uh, next up, Life Tags. This is a search tool from Google where you can find over 4 million images from Life Magazine. Um, AI has gone through and categorized all of them and tagged them, so it's easy to find things from that. Great for some primary source uh, images. Next up is Talk to Books. This is a search tool from Google where you can type in a natural language question, and Google will search over 100,000 books to find an answer to your question and even jump you right to the page in the book where you can read what it says about the topic you have asked about. Uh, Socratic. 
is a tool from Google that's a mobile tool. This works on Android and iOS, and it's a homework helper. So a student can install Socratic on their phone, uh, fire up the app, and then basically just use their phone's camera to take a picture of what they're learning about. So they could just point it at their textbook and take a picture of their textbook page, or a math problem, or a paragraph off of a website, really anything they take a picture of. And then Socratic will digest that, figure out what you took a picture of, pull the text out of it, and then we'll come up with, hey, here are videos that help teach that. Here are websites that support that. Here are you know, related you know, content online uh, that can help you with that. So this is a great way if a student is struggling to be able to get some additional homework help. It could be great for you as a teacher also if you're just looking for more resources that help support a particular topic. Cool stuff. Next up, uh, Tenor. This is a search tool from Google to find animated GIFs. Um, not all of them are school friendly. Of course, that's always the case with animated GIFs. But if you're looking for uh, a GIF to add to a slideshow, or you want to put a GIF on your website, or you want to put a GIF on social media, and you're looking for stuff, uh, Google's Tenor.com website is uh, one of my places I always go when I'm looking for some good animated GIFs to liven up a presentation. Uh, next up in search is the VR and AR models that Google is building into mobile search. So on your phone, try this out sometime. When you're on your phone, if you run a Google search for things like animals, so like in this case, a tiger, a lot of animals, uh, planets, body systems. Let me see, they added uh, insects. Recently, they added Olympic athletes. They're adding new things all the time to it. But what happens is you run a search for like a tiger, and on the search page that comes up, one of the buttons is going to say view in 3D. And you'll click it, and it will give you a 3D model of it, of the animal, or whatever the thing is. And then it'll say below that, view in my space. And if you click that, what it does is it lets you point your camera around your room, and it will actually drop a live 3D AR augmented reality version of that thing in your classroom or your living room. So you can have a tiger, you can have a you can have a T-Rex in your classroom, or you can have the planet Jupiter, or you can have you know an atomic model. And you can walk around it. You can see it from different angles. You can make it bigger, smaller. And it's not just a picture. It actually moves like the tiger growls and moves around. So it's a really awesome way to be able to get up close and personal to something right there in your classroom or in your front yard or wherever you want to put it. So check out those searches on mobile. Uh, next up in searching is Google's FAC fact check tools. Uh, this is a website they have uh, released recently where you can go and type in any topic that you're curious about to see how that topic has been fact checked. And it'll bring up lots of articles that have been fact checked so that you can say, ah, this, this claim is false or, oh, this is true. And here is the research behind it. And I think we're getting really close to the end of our search. We're about ready to switch to another category here. Uh, Google Lens uh, is within the search category, though, still. Google Lens is a, uh, a tool that Google has created that is on both Android and iOS. So it runs on mobile. There's a Google Lens app, but it's also inside of Google Photos as well. You can use it there. Basically, again, you just take a picture of anything, and it runs a search on it and brings back information. So uh, I've used this um, when I wanted to identify something on one of my hikes. I love, love, love hiking. So if I come across a flower and I'm not sure what it is, or um, I would have been doing some, some mushroom foraging and like, oh, I'm not sure what is this one. You take a picture of it and Google runs a search and brings back information about what that is. It's also great for taking a picture of things that have text because it can pull the text out and uh, read it aloud to you as well. Whew, that was a lot of search tools. We made it though. <laughs> We're gonna have to keep on moving though because we got a lot of awesome other things to look at here. So continue to let me know if you uh, have any questions or comments on any of the stuff we've seen so far, I'm doing my best to keep an eye on the chat. Looks like we're doing good, but you feel free to let me know if you've got questions or comments. So let's keep on moving. Let's head into hipster Google tools for mapping. And by the way, if anybody has joined late and doesn't have the agenda document and would like it, uh, it is absolutely available on the conference website as well. But just to make it easy for you, I just dropped it into the chat again. Um, and that way you can pull up this uh, this document, if, and it's always at bit.ly slash curves dash hipster as well. That has all of the resources. So let's get into our mapping tool. 
So the first one here, you're going to say, Eric, this is not a hipster tool. Everybody knows about Google Earth. And I bet you're right. Most everybody knows about Google Earth. You are so true there. But what's neat is Google Earth has added new features in there that are lesser known. And you may not be aware of some of these features in there. And so what I want to do is take a moment and talk about some of the lesser known Google Earth uh, features that are in there. So one of the uh, newest features that's been added to Google Earth is something called time lapse. And um, what it does, it will take the last, I don't know, almost like 30 some years of satellite imagery and it will it'll play like a video showing you an animation of how things have changed over the last you know, three decades. And this is an amazing way to be able to see the growth of a city or deforestation or the um, uh, changes with a glacier or uh, you know, um, the changes to coastlines, things like that. Now to get to it, you go into Google Earth and then on the left-hand side, if you look down the, um, the tools on the left, the third one down is the Voyager button. If you click on that, it looks like a little steering wheel for a ship. Uh, that brings up the, the Voyager tools. And in here, there's loads of awesome stuff, lots of pre-made tours, like, you know, yeah, you want to learn about the Underground Railroad or James Cook's First Voyage or Poetry Around the World. These are fantastic pre-made tours. But in the same area, under nature, I think is where they have it, you'll see time lapse in Google Earth. So that's one of the newest things they've added, which again shows you 37 years of satellite imagery. So if I click on time lapse, what it's going to do is open up a special panel over here on the right. And what I can do now is I can type in any place on Earth I want. So I could come in here and I could type in my hometown. I could type in, you know, you know, a different city somewhere else on the Earth, anywhere I want. I could type in. And what it's going to do is it's going to go to that location and it's going to start playing through the last 37 years. And across the top, you'll see it's up to 2020 and then it uh, swings around to 1994 and then starts playing through. And so in this case, I'm not sure where we're at on this particular one, but this is showing uh, changes in agriculture over that time. So um, it looks like when it first starts, we'll loop back around. Yeah, you can see how this is almost all just open green area and little by little, they're developing all of these farms on there. Well, um, you can go through some pre-selected things that they've got, or you can type in your own and fly anywhere on earth. Uh, a good example would be, let's see, how about if we look at urban growth and let's go to, um, let's go to Las Vegas. That's usually a pretty good one to be able to see. And again, it does take a little while for it to load the information in because it's, you know, it's the satellite images. So there's 37 years that it's creating like a video out of. So, so give it a little time. It may have to pass through it, you know, once or twice for all of the uh, details <laughs> to come in. But once they do, like I said, here's, here's Las Vegas. And once it loops back around, we'll see how small the city was. And then we can just watch it grow and grow and grow and grow as it expands out. And because this is Google Earth, if you prefer to do this in 3D, you can come down here, we can click on the uh, 2D, 3D button, and we can even get a 3D uh, model of this as uh, we're seeing the growth of Las Vegas over time. So awesome stuff, really, really neat. Just one of the cool things Google has added to Google Earth. Well, let's keep on going with maps. Uh, another uh, lesser known Google tool in the map category is landlines. Um, this is just a really simple little tool. I could see using this with, with younger kids talking about natural versus man-made. So what happens here is you draw on the screen a little squiggle, and then Google tries to find things on the earth that match the shape you drew. Eh, sometimes it's a little bit of a better match than others. It kind of depends. And it, and it gets new pictures. It's new images every time. So every time you run this, it's a new set of, I believe, 20 images. Uh, but it could be an interesting way to talk again about natural versus man-made shapes. That's landlines. Uh, oh, and we did mention time-lapse inside of Google Earth. Heads up, there's also a time-lapse standalone site as well. If you don't want to fire up the entire Google Earth, there is a link just to the standalone time-lapse site as well.
Uh, other cool mapping tools, EarthView is a collection of thousands of the most beautiful images taken from Google Earth. Could be a great way just to explore a different spot on the Earth or to get inspiration as, as a writing prompt. If you get tired of Earth, though, hey, you can go to space. Uh, there's Google Maps for planets and moons at google.com slash maps slash space. You can choose from all the different planets. You can also pick a lot of different moons, as well as the International Space Station. And it's basically a Google Earth model, but it's Mars instead. You can you know zoom in and swing it around and, and see uh, what the planet looks like, just like you're using Google Earth, but with planets. If you really want to learn more about Mars, you can go to Access Mars and you can dive into that one. This is where they've taken all of the photos that the Curiosity rover has collected and they've created a street view um, tool here on Mars. So you can basically walk around on the surface of Mars just like you're doing street view here on Earth. Just a really neat way to put yourself into that place. A new tool that came out just recently in the mapping category is Flume. I think it's only for Android right now, may come out for iOS later. It's a pretty fun little tool. What you do is you point your camera at the ground, and then it makes this little uh, twirly thing. When you click it, it drills a hole straight through the earth, and it shows you what's on the other side of the globe. So you can tilt your phone and point it at different locations, and it will tell you what you're hovering above. And when you're ready, you click the button, and it goes zoop, and it flumes through the earth and it shows you what's on the other side of where you're pointing. And then you can click on that and it'll open it up in Google Earth and you can learn all about that location. So ah, just kind of a, a neat way to get a, a perspective on what's on the other side of the planet. All right, that was some mapping tools. Let's go into our next category of creative tools. So in the category of creative tools, loads of neat things here. One of the first ones is Google Fonts. Now, I'm sure everybody knows that Google has fonts. So like if you're inside of, you know, a Google document, you're like, oh, I want to change the font. You know, we know we can, you know, select some text, go up to the font menu and pick, you know, pick different fonts. And we can go to the more fonts button to find others. The challenge is sometimes it's hard to find the font you're looking for. It's like there's so many. Google has like a thousand fonts. You're like, hey, yeah, what's a what's a good one? What's what's the one that's going to look the way I want it to? Well, if you go to fonts.google.com, there is a website where Google has pulled together all of their fonts in one place. And what's so nice about this is, for example, you can type in the thing that you want to use the font on. So let's say maybe I want to do hipster Google and I want a cool, a cool title font for it. So I could type in, for example, hipster Google. And then I can come here and start narrowing down and say, okay, for categories, oh, uh, just show me the display fonts. And for the properties, let's do something with some thickness to it. Let's look for a font that's a little bit thicker. And so I could start adjusting all these sliders and now it's gone from 1,075 fonts down to 41. And now it's like, okay, these are 41 fonts that fit your criteria. When I find one I liked, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly the one I was looking for. I can take note of the name of it. And then of course I can go back to my document and I can add that font at that point. Now, if I also want, I can click on the font while I'm here to learn more about it, as well as get suggestions for good font pairings to go with it. Now, one other thing I'm going to mention before we leave Google Fonts behind is it's not just fonts anymore. They actually did some new stuff with it. In addition to being just fonts, if you look in the top right-hand corner, they also have icons now. So they have uh, hundreds and hundreds or thousands and thousands of icons available. Uh, these are all free to download and use any way you want. They're nice, clean icons, um, and you can search or browse through all of these uh, different uh, icons in these different categories and download those and use those for free in any project that you have. Good stuff. What else can fall under creativity? Um, quick draw. This is a fun one. I won't open it up, but this is this is the one where you play Pictionary with Google's AI. Uh, the computer tells you to draw something, you try to draw it, and then, then the, the AI tries to guess what you're drawing. It's a really neat experiment in uh, helping you know, Google's artificial intelligence understand what doodles look like. Well, it wasn't just a game. It actually ended up getting used in a tool called AutoDraw, which is the next one we have in the list here. AutoDraw is a drawing tool that assists you. It's got the normal, you know, pencil and 
paint can and shapes and all that, but it's got this special button called auto draw. And if I click on that button and I try to draw something, well, let's say I'm going to draw a dog and I know this does not look like it, it looks like a table, but we're just going to pretend it's a dog. So here's his tail and then here's his head. And let's say I'm trying to draw this dog here. As I'm doing that across the top, Google's trying to guess <laughs> what I'm drawing. And I can say, yep, yep, I was drawing a dog. And then I can click on their version of a dog and it will replace my version with their version. And so then I can move it around and I can color it in and I can add new things. I can build an entire scene here. And of course I can download it when I'm all done. Well, this tool is a standalone tool here, but it also is integrated into other things. Like if you use Book Creator, AutoDraw is built into that. If you use Jamboard on a mobile device, AutoDraw is built into that. Just a really neat way to provide you with some additional support if you're artistically challenged, perhaps. <laughs> so that's AutoDraw. Uh, other creativity tools that are worth checking out. Toontastic is a free mobile app, so you can run this on a phone or a tablet or uh, Android or a uh, Chromebook that supports Android apps. Toontastic allows you to create 3D animated digital puppet shows. <laughs> so basically the students pick a background, they drop characters on it, and then they hit record. And basically what the students do is they drag the, the characters around the screen and speak for them. And so as they move the characters around the screen, the students are speaking, it records the students' voices and the characters as they're moved around and it saves a video. And so you can tell stories, uh, you can explain concepts and it's all, and it's all done, you get this awesome video. It's basically 3D animated digital puppet shows. Uh, great way to tell stories, neat tool. Uh, next up is Meme Buddy. This is one way you can create a meme. Uh, if you go to the website, uh, you simply have to give it a command. In this case, they're showing an example where they say, make a meme of George Washington that says, founding fathers know best. Well, Google's AI then dissects what you said, finds the picture you asked for, and puts the text that you asked for on it. Then you can right click on it and download it, and it will generate a meme for you. Pretty cool. Neat stuff. Uh, next up, oh, a bunch of music ones. Oh my gosh, there are so many great music tools that Google has put out. Music Lab is one of my favorites. This is a collection of about 14 different um, interactive experiments with music. So I'm going to head over to the site and I'll actually pull up the first one because this one we can do together. The first one is a collaborative experiment. So this is the shared piano. Let me go and open this one up just as a quick example. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste the link to it into the chat. If anybody wants to join me, you can. So at the bottom left, I'm going to click copy link and then I'm going to go to the chat. And I'm going to drop this into the chat and you don't have to join me, but if anybody wants to jump in here with me, you can. And what I can do is I can use the keyboard by clicking on it there, or I can use my keyboard on my computer and I can change the uh, instrument. So it's a piano at the moment, but I can make it a drum kit or I can make it a woodwind and so forth. So everybody who jumps in, we got some people in there right now, we can all play together. And so this would only be, we're making beautiful music together, aren't we? So yes, this would allow us to, uh, no matter where we're at, <laughs> to be able to play some wonderful music together. <laughs> and then we can save what we've done and can play that back. Very nice, guys. <laughs> well, you can keep on playing. I'm going to go ahead and exit back out of it myself, but you, the party can go on without me if you would like. <laughs> but uh, uh, the other tools here, there's just so many awesome ones. There's a song maker. There's one to explore rhythm, sound waves. This one's great for science because you can actually see how the sound waves change based upon the pitch. Um, or the, 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 the frequency of the notes. Uh, and we've got loads of harmonics, uh, strings, chords, oscillators. Each one of these are just an awesome, cute little experiment that you can use with your students to learn about music concepts and many times applying it to other subject areas as well. All right, let's keep on going. Um, oh, Tyler said 10 at a time. So yeah, that may be the year, right? We may have a limit to how many people can jump in at once. So you're probably right, 10 at a time on that uh, interactive one. 
Uh, other ones that are music related, Groove Pizza allows you to explore rhythms by putting uh, these three circles together of, uh, of a pizza, as they call it, and each one, each vertex point is a beat. Uh, you can change different instruments you're using, and you can turn on the uh, angle measures if you want to uh, turn this into a math lesson on the interior angles of a polygon. Pretty cool. AI Duet lets you play music with an AI, so you play the piano and then Google AI plays with you. Uh, Inside Music uh, takes a, um, a song and breaks it down into its component parts, so you can uh, just isolate the guitars or the drums or the vocals and see what makes a song a song. Uh, semiconductor allows you to conduct an orchestra with your webcam. Uh, you put yourself, in, you just kind of center yourself in the webcam, and then as you move your arms, if you move them up, it gets louder, down is softer, left and right is the different instruments, and the faster you move your arms, the faster the orchestra plays. So a neat way to explore what it would be like to be a conductor. Blob Opera allows you to play with harmonies. Uh, you drag the blobs up and down to change the uh, the pitch. You can drag them forwards and backwards to change the vowel sounds they're making. And then the other blobs harmonize with you. So it's a neat way to explore creating harmonies. Tone Transfer is an AI tool that lets you take any sound. You can add your own and it will use AI to convert it into a flute, saxophone, trumpet, or violin to see what would my voice sound like if it was a saxophone, for example. Uh, Listen to Transformers, a collection of thousands of AI-generated songs if you want to explore what a, uh, a computer might think is music. Uh, Paint with Music is a really new one. This one just came out a couple months ago, where what you're doing is you're drawing on the screen, and the higher you draw, the higher the pitch is, and the lower the, 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 lower the note is. And then there's this little uh, timer that goes, and so you can draw on the screen and you can use different instruments as you draw and it will play through what you've drawn and make beautiful music. So really cool. Assisted Melody is another AI one that helps you uh, create a harmony with a famous composer. So you play your, uh, uh, your melody that you want to play and then you choose Bach, Mozart, or Beethoven. And what has happened is Google has fed all of their music into the AI that then uh, will say, okay, well, if Bach were to play with you, here's what he might play. And so you play your melody and then Bach, Mozart, or Beethoven will go through and add all of their music in there as well. It's really cool. Uh, it can take a, a very bad thing that I create and it actually sounds pretty <laughs> when it's done. Um, another creativity tool, we're moving away from music now, just some other creativity tools, Chrome Canvas. Uh, this is great if you just need a really quick whiteboard. Now, Jamboard is a wonderful whiteboard. There's a lot of great things about using Jamboard. But if you just need a really quick, simple whiteboard, canvas.apps.chrome, that's Chrome Canvas. It will allow you to uh, create just a very simple blank whiteboard, and you've got some uh, easy drawing tools on it. So if I came in and just said, let's do a new drawing, you see I've got my drawing tools down the side here, and I can change the thickness and the color. And then I could use that if I was, you know, teaching math and I just wanted to work out, you know, a math problem real quick. I could come in here and create my math problem and start, you know, changing colors and solving it. Now, it's not collaborative. It's just one person doing it. But if you just need to be able to demonstrate something for your students real quick and just looking for a quick, easy to use whiteboard, Chrome Canvas is a nice one for that. Just Align, oh, I love this tool. Just Align is a mobile app that lets you draw in 3D space. So what you do is you uh, take your camera and then you put your finger on the screen and whenever you touch the screen, it'll start drawing about two or three feet in front of you. So if you can, you can walk around the room touching the screen and you can make lines and things all around the room in 3D space. You can then look through your phone and see what you created hanging there in augmented reality. You can hit the record button and you can walk through your creation, narrating what it is. And there's even a collaborate button where somebody else can join you and you both can draw in the same 3D space. Really neat stuff. Verse by verse is another relatively recent tool from Google that lets you uh, write poetry with the help of 
famous American poets. So what you do is you pick three poets that you want to have help you out of a big collection that they have. You write the first line of the poem, and then the AI, which knows everything these people have ever written, looks at what you wrote and then suggests what Emily Dickinson might write, for example. And then you can use the suggestions from those poets as your next line, or you can just get inspired by them. And line by line by line, they keep revising what their suggestion is for the next line. Oh, we got so many to look at here. Uh, Chimera Painter, this is a, an art one where you draw a fantastical creature using these different colors, red for the head, pink for the wings, blue for the mouth, and then Google's AI will create a somewhat photorealistic version of your fantastic creature. Then there's Scroobly, which lets you draw a, uh, a, a model around a, a little skeletal frame here, and then using your webcam, you start moving around and it animates the creature you created. So you make this drawing, then through the webcam, you can you know, move your face, move your mouth, move your arms, and it will animate your creation and you can save it as an animated GIF as well. So a neat way to practice some digital animation, fun stuff there. Uh, Monster Mash is another new one that uh, has come out in the last few months where you basically draw a really simple sketch and then the AI kind of blows it up like a balloon animal <laughs> and then you can animate it. You can drag it around and uh, uh, put it into a loop and have it walking or moving and so forth. So another neat way to do some uh, 3D animation. Emoji Kitchen, this one only works on Gboard, so that would be Google's uh, keyboard, which I think is probably just on Android. So sorry if you're an iOS user, I don't think this one applies to you, but it's a really neat creativity thing. So uh, using Google's Gboard on your phone, you can pick any two emojis and it will combine them into a new a new emoji, and they have over 14,000 combinations. And so what, what it creates a new emoji out of it, and then when you can send that, it sends it as a sticker. So even if somebody's on like an iPhone and they can't combine them like that, they can still see the stickers that get created from it. It's really cool. Woo, okay, we got a few more to get. We're doing good, guys. We're in the home stretch here. Again, if there's anything that uh, you got questions on, throw it in the chat or if there's something that you uh, wanna make sure we get to, let me know and I'm happy to make sure we cover it in the time we have left. So communication tools, some neat googly tools that fall into this category would be things like the Google Translate mobile app. Love, love, love that app. It's a wonderful way to be able to translate on the go as well as even translating uh, images. So you can point your phone at a at a, at a sign uh, that's in a different language and it will translate it live inside of your phone, which is wonderful. Uh, Data Gift Maker is a neat communication tool to jazz up your graphs. So instead of just having a simple bar graph or a pie chart, they've got all of these different animated graphs. You feed your data into it and then it will create this neat animation to show your data in a more engaging way. And then you can save that as a GIF and use it wherever you would like. Live transcribe is a communication tool that does closed captions for life. Basically, you put your phone out in front of you, you turn on live transcribe, the app, and anything that gets said will be typed up right there on your phone. So uh, this would be wonderful if a student is having a hard time hearing, just sitting down in the corner of their desk and anything the teacher's saying, anything that's happening around them, they would be able to, uh, um, to see that typed up in front of them and it saves the transcripts as well. Other ones that fall into this communication category, sound amplifier, if somebody's having a hard time hearing, this is a Google mobile app that if you put headphones in and you fire up the sound amplifier button, it can do noise cancellation to cut out background noise and then it can boost people's voices so that you can hear people better. Uh, look to speak is uh, another communication tool for somebody who is unable to speak they can use their eyes to look on the screen left and right to narrow down through a list of responses, and then it will uh, speak for them when they get to the response that they wanted to say. And I think the last one in this category is Google Recorder, which is uh, um, a uh, app from Google that will record, obviously, sound around you, but it doesn't just record the sound, it will do a, um, a uh, transcript of it as well. So everything that it records, you can play back through, but it will also transcribe it for you. And you can even run a search and it will jump you right to the spot in the recording that uh, that had that text in there. 
Okay, I think we're gonna make it. We're into our final category of miscellaneous tools. I did see a question pop up about the tiger in the room did not work. Is there a re system requirement on the phone? There is, I'm sorry, I don't know, Shruti, what the um, requirements are, but yes, to be able to do like the T-Rex and the tiger and have that show up um, on your phone in your room, it does require the phone to have a certain level of processing ability to do that. And I apologize, I don't know the exact criteria for it, but I have I have seen that. Yes, that it does it, it does depend upon the phone that you're using. Okay, last stretch here, some miscellaneous tools. These probably could have fit into some other categories, but I wasn't sure, so I put them, put them here. So we've got things like Google Arts and Culture. I know I've mentioned that before a bunch of times. A lot of the things we've seen have been arts and culture related. If you are still not familiar with this site, it's amazing. It's great for art, but it's also great for social studies. It's not just an art site. Basically what it is, is Google's attempt to digitally uh, record every uh, painting, sculpture, but also primary source documents, basically trying to record our culture and have access to it. So if you come here, the easiest way to explore, I think, is to go up to the button in the top left. And here, you can explore their collections, their themes, but you can also dive into specific artists or historical events. So again, a big focus on fine arts and a big focus on social studies. So for example, if I go into the artist section, I could say, hey, I wanna learn about Van Gogh. And I could you know, read about Van Gogh and I could say, oh, I wanna check out one of his paintings. Here's Starry Night. And I could learn all about Starry Night. But what's really cool is I can zoom in on things. And the zooming is what is just so phenomenal because as Google has scanned in all of these paintings and primary source documents, they have done it at such, it's gonna take a little while for it all to it just to give, it a, give it a little bit. It's still, it's still pulling it in, but look at that. Oh my gosh, we can see the brush strokes. We can see the cracks in the canvas. It's amazing. You can get up close and personal in ways you never would be able to otherwise. And again, it's not just art. If you, if you go down to, for example, historical events or historical figures. You can go into all of these different historical events, and for each of those, they have thousands and thousands and thousands of primary source documents that, again, are scanned in in high resolution. It's amazing to be able to access all that content there. A couple other things. Uh, the Arts and Culture also has a mobile uh, version that does some fun things like being able to take a picture of yourself and finding artwork that looks like you. Kind of a fun way to explore that. Other cool things, uh, Symantris is a neat vocab game that's like Tetris, uh, but with words falling down and you have to type in uh, sim you have to type in similar words at the bottom. You can't type in any of the words that show up here, but you have to type in something that would, would, would relate to one. So I couldn't type in motorcycle, but I could type in bike, and then it will get rid of that block in any of the same colors touching it. So this is a great way for kids to work on synonyms or similar vocabulary, and more words fall as the game goes on. Uh, puzzle Party, is from arts and culture. It lets you basically do a jigsaw puzzle from a famous work of art. <laughs> and you can do it collaboratively, collaboratively with others. Art coloring book allows you to take a famous work of art, turn it into a black line coloring book master, and then you can color in a famous work of art. Uh, Grasshopper is an app that allows you to learn JavaScript coding in fun, small, self-paced lessons. Applied uh, Digital Skills is a wonderful website with over 150 pre-made lessons to teach technology skills like how to write a resume, how to organize your drive, how to create a quiz in Google Forms, how to make a good presentation. It's good for you, it's good for your students, and every lesson already has pre-recorded videos that take you step by step through it. Don't miss this site. It's phenomenal, the amount of resources that are there. A couple other last minute things here. Um, oh, let's see. Re, uh, Read Along is a great app. Uh, it's only for Android, but it's a great app that helps teach uh, students uh, to read. We've got Stack, which is a recent uh, app that came out, which is a PDF scanner for your phone that not only will scan in things, but will do OCR and pick out the key elements from it to help you find receipts or other documents again, which is nice. Measure Up is a tool from Google that lets you use your phone to measure things in the real world, so length and area and volume. Uh, the Google Fishing Quiz is a great site if you want to see uh, can you be tricked by uh, you know, by emails that are trying to get your information, and it goes through uh, a bunch of examples. Uh, it's a great fishing quiz to take. 
And then the last thing, we made it to the last, and I saved this one for last because I think it is perfect after so many things that we just got exposed to, we might need a Mindful Break. So Mindful Break is a Chrome extension that I've got installed. It's up here in the top right-hand corner. And what it is, is an extension that you set a timer on. You say every, you know, one hour or two hours or whatever time you want, uh, you, you, you set it and it will pop up and, and ask you to take a Mindful Break. It'll ask you to pause what you're doing and um, reflect on something. And what it will give you is when it goes ding and it pops up, it'll give you a little um, quote, something inspirational, something to do, something to think about. Um, and then if you want, in addition to getting that little break uh, to think about something like that, you can also click on the link below there that says try a breathing exercise, which will take you through a one minute breathing exercise, which wouldn't that be wonderful to do every now and then and kind of recenter ourselves. And after all the tools we just saw, we might need that. Well, folks, we are, <laughs> we have made it to the end of all of that. And so as we start to wrap up, a couple of things I want to mention as we begin to wrap up here. Uh, first of all, everything that you saw here in this session and more, because I'll be always adding new things to it over time, can be found at bit.ly slash Kurtz dash hipster. That'll get you to that Google document. Again, I'll throw that link into the chat one more time in case anybody uh, still needed that, but you can always get to it at the bit.ly link. Um, I want to remind you that you can get a certificate for this session and all the sessions that we're doing here at the Spark Conference. You'll notice on the conference website located uh, below the listing of each session, there is a Google Form link that you can go to fill out um, your information and it will auto generate a PDF certificate of attendance and send that to you. That is true for both of the live sessions and the pre-recorded ones. Our intention is to have the videos available through the end of October. So over the next few months, as you get time, you can return to the site and pick off some other sessions you didn't get to see. And hopefully this will be valuable PD to help you kick off your school year and learn awesome new things to help make your teaching and learning better. Uh, the, re the, the recording of this session will be available shortly, not right away, but once we get a chance to process the, these recordings, they'll be available on the site as well. Other than that, I just wanna thank you guys so much for taking time out of your day. I hope you uh, got some great ideas out of this. If you've got any more final questions, I um, will keep an eye <laughs> over here in the chat and I'll be happy to take those. Otherwise, uh, please have a fantastic, wonderful uh, rest of the conference.